HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Somewhere out there, there's a man on a park bench eating his 500th PB&J. He has no idea Papa John's has new papadillas that are way better than a boring sandwich. With Papa John's best meats, cheeses, and veggies hand-folded into a crispy flatbread crust. Someone better tell that man. Get a new papadilla in one of four flavors for just six bucks. Better ingredients, better pizza, better than a sandwich. Papa John's. Not valid with discounts, fees, and taxes. Extra prices may vary. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken audio entertainment and information. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Get a free book when you sign up for a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth. Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast continues to gain recognition as a great resource for small business owners, aspiring entrepreneurs, sales professionals, uh, business leaders of all kinds. Uh, And that is because of the guests who join me uh, to have a conversation where they share their expertise with all of you. You can take what you need, you can leave the rest, uh, and you can implement um, some of the ideas that you hear and learn in your business so that You can be more successful, uh, do better things with your business, whatever it is you're looking for. Today, my guest is Chris Kluver. Chris is a seasoned solopreneur who started his first company at age 19 in Omaha, Nebraska. Since then, he's been directly involved in the creation, operation, growth, and occasional sale of more than 20 successful businesses, ranging from commercial real estate development and management to content marketing and daily social media operations. Chris is also the author of The Aspiring Solopreneur. Thanks so much for joining me today, Chris. Well, thank you so much for for having me on. I'm truly humbled. Well, I really appreciate it. Um, I were the things that I already know we're going to talk about are, are really going to be great. And I and I want to start with motivation uh, because. I think it's such a, an important part of uh, being successful, 
uh, deciding to launch, you know, at, at any aspect, any point in, in time, um, motivation has an awful lot to do with uh, how we proceed, you know, whether we, we get where we're going or not. Um, and you talk about the three T's, time, treasure, and talent. So I'm wondering if you can share the listeners um, how we can define our motivation by looking at those three things. Well, the way that I look at it is that I think um, we live in the most abundant times ever, and it's never been easier or safer to go out and build your own business. But, but to do it well, we have to first define where we're going before we know how we're going to get there. And to do that, we have to really clearly identify what are our motivations? What really floats my boat? Why am I doing this? And so often we, we hand that off to the wine commercials or our peers or our parents, and it comes in the form of maybe accolades or dollars. But it, it's not necessarily that. For, for most people, the motivations are very different. It has to do with maybe you want to have the flexibility for more time. Maybe you want to go to your daughter, every one of your daughter's speech tournaments or soccer games. Or maybe you do want more accolades. Or maybe you do want more money. But whatever it is, defining what, what success is on your terms, first and foremost, I really believe is, is the starting point. Because if we don't, when you transition from working for somebody or into a new business, we don't want you just transitioning one gerbil wheel for another. We, don't, we want to get off that roller coaster. And to do that, we have to start with defining what, what's, what's the most important from our time. You know, what do I want to do? What, what does success look like for you in most time? What are you looking for in your treasure? Stuff, money. And then talent. How is it you want the accolades? How do you want to sharpen the saw? What is it you want to be known for? And how do you want to help? Okay. I just, I love that. Okay. So I think it's so, I was listening to that and I was thinking one of the great things for me about that is that everyone defines success differently and no one, there's no one definition that is more right or wrong than any others. It's just, this is mine, and I have to be able to really identify what are the things that matter to me in order to be able to then figure out how to move forward to get them. Well, and, and, and that's where I think, you know, I, candidly, I think for the most part, we kind of suck at that. You know, yeah. a lot of us, the last goal we set in our life is to get a college degree, or then maybe it's to buy a house, or maybe it's to... but. But rarely do we actually step back and say, dude, what's going to really float my boat? What's going to make me really, really happy? What means that I'm winning on my terms? And, and I think that's an area where, as an old guy at 52, I think the millennials are answering the right questions. Yeah. Whereas before, it was all about money, 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 more, more, more. You know, I, I lived in the 80s when it was big hair and big cars and cocaine and, you know, really excess, excess, <laughs> excess. And now, people are looking at a, at a lighter, lighter way of looking at it. You know, it's craft beer and tiny houses. Well, that's a different version of success. Right. Right. That's so funny. And by the way, you can't be old at 52 because that <laughs> makes me really old at 58. So no, I, I just, I don't, but I do understand what you're saying about the, the difference in generations and the things that, that are important to them. And I totally agree with you. I think the millennials have got it figured out that they, want to be part of something meaningful. They want to enjoy their lives, not just, you know, make a whole lot of money. It's not whoever has the most toys at the end wins. They, they really want a well-rounded existence. Uh, so that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, and I think we're raising them. So they got it, must have learned it somewhere. So, I'm curious about internal and external motivations and how they align, but I think before I, I would like you to talk about how they align, I think I'd like you to explain the difference. I mean, internal, I, I get, I think we talked about them, but what are external motivations? Well, it's, you could look at it in so many different ways, but, but for the most part, if you think about if, if the – 
if the, the people in the previous generation were looking more at survival and a philosophy of abundance, or excuse me, a philosophy of, of scarcity and we need more stuff, more, more stuff, more, you know, security, more food, bigger, 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 more, more, more. I think, I think that's where it's how people look at it on the outside. I think on the inside, it comes down to, am I happy? Um, and do I feel like I'm spiritually well-rounded? Do I, and, and in the book, we have a, I, an, I offer a, a balance wheel, but it's an exercise to sort of review that. But the intention is if you're a millennial and you're all in on the spirituality and the friends and the relationship and, you know, the health perspective, okay, right on. But you know what, if you're not making the, if you're not making the house payment, if you're not getting by, well, you're out of balance versus if you're making all the money in the world and you've got great, you know, uh, great professional accolades, but your wife hates you and you're an alcoholic and you're fat and out of control and nobody yeah. likes you because you're an SOB, well, you're probably not happy either. So how do you find that balance both internally and externally? So I, I am all about profit. I am all about success. I am all about, you know, capitalism. I am wholeheartedly a fiduciary responsibility for me is to drive dollars. I, I make no bones about that but it's also to protect what is the engine that drives that. And that's going to be the person within. And in the long term, I think that that balance is the most fiscally responsible thing we can do. I kind of got on a, you know, huh. went down a rabbit hole on that, but that's sort of the direction that I look at that. I get that. It sort of feels to me, if I'm understanding it, it's that, that the internal is how do I feel? Am I happy? Am I fulfilled? And the external is these are responsibilities that I have that I have to make sure that I'm meeting and they have to be in alignment. Well, I, I think they do. I mean, if you're going to have kids, you, you still need to be responsible for your kids. You still have to do things that maybe you don't want to do. Or if you're going to have a car, you can't just have a car and not make the payment. Or, but what are the... So, so finding out what that balance is, we still live in a world where you have to, it's not just all, you know, pixies and fairy dust. We, we still have to make the, make the trains run on time. How do we find those things that we can find alignment? And when you can find what really floats your boat, what really makes you happy, and you get to go to work every day instead of having to go to the salt mines, you win. And, and to me, that's what it's got to start. But once you figure that out, it's, it's kind of like taking a vacation, I've never known anybody who took a vacation by just getting in the car and driving and saying, okay, well, where do you want to go? And, or, you know, do we have the kids? Did we lock the house? Do we have any car? Do we have clothes? No, nobody. That's insane. That sounds ridiculous, but that's how most people choose to lead their lives. Yeah. And that's how a lot of people go after their business. It's, it, it's total reactionary mode. And I want to, I want to transition people's thinking to proactive, very intentional, and then based on that, they can, they can thrive at it rather than just getting by. Okay, that, that makes a ton of sense to me, and, and I appreciate it. So how does someone, so this is great, because now this, this question is, is perfect. How does someone align internal and external motivation? It feels like a big question. Okay. I think, I think to do that, they have to be really pragmatic and really define what success is on their terms. I know I keep saying that, but, but that's what I mean. If, if they're trying to, if you go after and you, maybe you're really good at being an accountant and you roll into being an accountant because your parents want you to and you're, it's a safe thing and you're pretty good at it, but you hate it. And then you have to have the, the trappings of what an accountant does, which means you're driving a Lexus and you have the house and the... And before you know it, you end up in this crazy trap and you lose, you lose control of all that alignment of what it is now. And, and then you lose control of your life. Now, if you want to go out on your own, it doesn't mean you can't, we can, it is so much easier than people think. And it's so much easier to thrive, but we don't take that half step back and think about what does success look like? And I think candidly, I think that's one of the biggest reasons why so many people struggle is most people who start their businesses are too smart and they don't, they think they can do everything and they think they should do everything and they, they uh -huh. don't have to. And that's where they get in trouble. And that's where, you know, how do you build those teams of, and people around you? 
the, the numbers would suggest that roughly 50% of all businesses will fail in the first five years. Wow. I would argue that the additional, the remaining 50% that nobody talks about, I would argue that close to 70% of those are succeeding despite themselves, but they're not thriving. They're, they're succeeding because they're being stubborn, because they won't let go, because they just keep, they're, but, mm-hmm. but they're not getting out of their own way. So if they can define what success is first, then the second thing is define what is it you do really, really well. Where is it, if you're a technician, where is it you can thrive as a technician? And then the third thing is to embrace that you don't have to know how to do everything else. You don't have to be an expert in all these other things. You can build a team to help you with that. But almost never does a business fail because somebody isn't great at doing the actual technical aspects of it. The typical reason is for some other boneheaded move, a real estate thing, a marketing thing, an admin thing, an accounting thing, who knows? And uh, how do we, but how do you transition that thinking? So again, I squirreled on you. Sorry about that. No, you didn't squirrel on me. I thought that was great. And I, and as you were talking about it, I was thinking about people I know and, and, and thinking, yeah, they just, quote, hung a shingle. They just decided to go into business, but they didn't stop and think about enough about, okay, what do I need? What do I want? What needs to happen here in order to create a, a process or a plan or, you know, who's going to do what kind of thing. And I, and I think you're right. I think most small business owners think they are supposed to do everything. They're supposed to know how to do everything. And it doesn't matter whether they like it or not. That's their job when it isn't. When it isn't. And they end up spending so much more time doing other stuff that they may yeah. suck at <laughs> and hate and is, is way below their pay grade. Yeah. But they can't get out of their own way because they're doing what they think they should be doing. So right. and not, to, not to talk up the book, but the intention is to yeah. transition people's thinking into that of four things. To me, if somebody's going to start a business, if they can transition their thinking to that of an investor, is this a good way to invest my money? Would you invest in a friend's business if they came to you with the same business plan? And if it says, hey, I'm really good at this and I'm going to hang out a shingle, would you invest in that? Probably not. But what is it you need to do to make yourself as the investor feel comfortable? What is it you need to do as a a manager managing the business, what is it you'd need to do to make yourself feel comfortable and what are all the components that you need to do? Who are the people you need help to help you with those? You can contract with anybody. There's an army of people out there to help us. It's spectacular. And then the third is how can you transition to thinking as a, as a business or as a business development person? If you don't have people coming in and any new business startup, people don't or very, very rarely do they hang a shingle and then suddenly they're busy 40 hours a week doing technician work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but people tend to go out and get into a big mess of a real estate that, oh, well, I rented an office that's only 3600 a month for the next nine years. And then, and I got my great logo and I've got my business cards. And I was like, okay, do you have any clients? <laughs> oh, well, they'll come, really. And, and are you going to go out and actually talk to people? Well, I'm in my office and... Um, but, and, and that's where those people are really, really smart. And then they get scared by other stuff that they don't understand. But like I said, dude, there's a whole army out there to help us succeed and yeah. not just get by, but thrive. And that's what's a crime. I think, I think that's, that's my crusade is I want people to thrive. I want, I, I believe extraordinary lives in that unreasonable. Freaking go out and be unreasonable. How can we do that? But it's not ready, fire, aim. Let's think about it. Let's build a plan. Let's be very, very, very intentional and methodical and follow people who've done it before so that when we go out there, we're thriving. And again, I'm rambling. I told you I find myself fascinating. It's, <laughs> I think it's, I, it's so funny. This is your crusade. I'm thinking to myself, yes, this is your crusade. And it's so great to hear someone so passionate about a topic. And before we continue, I'm going to go ahead and do a sponsor break. So then that's out of the way. Accelerate Your Business Growth Podcast is happy to be sponsored by Audible.com. Audible.com is a leading provider of spoken digital audio entertainment and information. 
They have over 150,000 titles to choose from, and you can listen to them on any device, including whatever you're hearing us on right now. And if you sign up at our link, which is audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, you get one free audiobook and a one-month trial of the service. Some examples of books you can listen to on audible.com are Two Brain Business 2.0 by Chris Cooper and The Aspiring Solopreneur by our guest, Chris Kluver. So visit audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth, explore the books that are of interest to you, and receive one free audiobook when you sign up for the trial. Today we are speaking with Chris Kluver about thinking like a client to clarify our unique value proposition, which leads to a thriving business. So I want to segue a little bit to um, clients and value proposition and, and uh, that sort of thing. And I, I want to talk to you some about target clients, uh, because I find when so many people go into business, they do exactly what you said before the break, where they figure if they put up a website, people are going to find them and, and buy from them, which is a little silly. Um, but I think the other thing they do is they think everybody is a good potential client, which is also not true. So I'm curious what you think the steps are that someone should go through to identify their target audience their target clients? A whole bunch of different steps. But to start with, I think that if we're working with people that we love to work with, we're probably going to do a better job. Yeah. So I think rather than trying to build the perfect mousetrap, I think that the good Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. If we can ask a question and listen twice as much as we talk, the world is ours. I think our key clients want to tell us exactly what they want. And it's a matter of us listening to that. So uh, to, be, to be exact, I think part of, of figuring out the right clientele is figuring out how to say no really, really well. Um, <laughs> I, I love a quote from Warren Buffett, being an Omaha guy. Uh, Warren Buffett says that successful people are really good at saying no. Really, really successful people are really, really good at saying no. <laughs> the more you can focus, the more you can narrow in on that, I think, I think the better you get. And we talk about this in uh, the book, the, in, uh, the Aspiring Solopreneur. And um, with this, if we can get people to help us figure out what is that last part. So again, the right people want to help us succeed. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen somebody come up and define, oh, I'm going to do this and this and this. And they take it and they try and make it absolutely perfect before they go out and talk to somebody. And I think this is the wrong approach because nine times out of 10, it's wrong. And we spend 80 versus if we have a pretty good idea of what we're looking to do, go out and start talking to people and say, Hey, I'm looking at doing this. What do you think about it? If you were in my shoes, what would you want? I, I'm not trying to sell you open and honest. I just want to hear where your head's at. Tell me what you think about it. What would, what would you value? Why, what would be important to you? What are the things that matter? What are the hot button issues? And, and use that to drill in even more to try and really clearly define what success is for them. So often uh, we go after our, our, what we're selling in a way that, hey, we're trying to tell people what our features and benefits are. And that's the wrong way. If, if we can define what is the itch we're really trying to scratch, how do we want to do that? And what is it we love to do? And where do we really excel? That to me is the starting point. You figure that out and then build from there. Does that make sense? It makes a ton of sense. And, and so what are some questions that people should be asking that target client, that target audience to, to make sure that they aren't trying to pull someone toward their solution, but that they really have identified and defined something of value to the marketplace? So, so I think before you ever do anything, I think talking to people and saying, um, if you can ask for help, traditionally, most people really want to help. And if you could say, look, I would love your opinion and feedback. Well, you're somewhat flattering, but 
the most beautiful sound anybody can ever hear is the sound of their own voice. And if somebody's asking for their opinion, why, yes, I would love to tell you about my Kung Fu training courses or whatever it is. Fair enough. But asking, hey, I'd like to get your opinion. I'm considering going out and doing this. So you've made it very, very safe. One, you're asking for their expertise. Two, you're saying you're considering doing something, so how you're gonna use it, but you're not doing it now, and that you'd put it into use sometime in the future. So there's no obligation or expectation with that. And you can ask some very generic questions around, hey, if you know, how, what is it you like about this or that? But realistically, if you're talking to somebody and you like them and they like you, they're probably not gonna be completely candid. So a way around this is to say, Hey, I, I, know, I know you like us and this is all good with us, but hypothetically, what is, it you, what is it you love about my industry and what is it you hate about my industry? So by doing that, you're taking away any personalization. You're not saying, what is it you like about my firm or me personally, or what is it you hate about me or my firm personally? But you're giving them carte blanche to say whatever they want about that area. And it's to me in that it's in those fringes that that's where some of that unreasonable, but greatness could potentially live. Does that make sense? Did that, uh, I kind of want to make a circle on that. But. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I like that a lot. I like it a lot, yeah, because it really gives people the opportunity to speak honestly and freely and um, help you, help them. Uh, but it's got to be, you have to really understand that you can only be successful if you are providing something that is of value to enough other people or companies. And I think part of it too is we're afraid. And, and this is something that is, uh, when I had my social media companies, um, my young people, meaning people under 35, drove me freaking insane because they would never get on a phone. They wanted to text or yeah. email everybody. <laughs> and it's like, no, this is something that you have to either get in front of them or actually talk to them with, with like real words on a phone because you're going to get a lot more interaction and you can read those people. And I think part of it is, is we have a fear of people saying no. And if yeah. you, if you, if you set it up, some people are going to say no, fair enough. Ask somebody else, call somebody else, call 20 people. And at least five of those will probably say yes. Hey, be respectful. Do you have time? This is what I'm doing. Be very direct and candid. I would love your feedback. Do you have 10 minutes? And then at nine and a half minutes say, look, I, I want to be respectful of your time and finish it, but be done with it. But yeah. I think if, if people do that, now if, you have, uh, if you're in an environment where maybe you have some restrictions or maybe you have a non-compete and it's against the rules, you don't have a non-compete you know, in Topeka, Kansas or in New Jersey or you know, Bend, Oregon. You can call people around the globe and say, hey, I'm looking in a different market and ask. And, and that same thing works really, really well with other people who are doing the business. Go across geographies, find out what's working and what's not. But I, I think you can do so much reconnaissance and it costs you virtually nothing except your time. And it's so important to gather that information so that you are operating from a position of knowledge, not assumption. Well, the old adage of uh, if you take you and me out of assume, you know what you're talking <laughs> <about>. <laughs> Exactly right. That's exactly right. Wow. Th this is uh, so I, I really love this concept because there's so much um, that, that is. I don't, I'm trying to think of the word that I'm looking for. It, 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 I, I was going to say basic, and unfortunately, it isn't really basic. It should be. It could be. It isn't necessarily. Uh, I think people complicate the journey, and I don't know if it's because they think it's supposed to be more complicated or harder than it is, or they're being told that they are supposed to be you know, pursuing certain things or doing things in a certain way. Do you, do you have any, any thoughts on that? I, I know people are afraid on the one side, but. I, I think, unfortunately, a lot of us, um, 
we hide in complexity. And uh, my favorite quote from Mark Twain, hands down, is, I'm sorry this letter is so long, I didn't have time to write a short one. <laughs> I think taking the time to write a short one so it sounds really simple, yeah. that's, where, that's where true valued success lives. You know, um, so I had some things happen to me a few years back that helped really change my perspective and trajectory. And, and as an example for what success looks like, for my wife and I, we like to take, uh, we, like, we met on a freighter in Patagonia, Chile traveling. And uh, I, we take about three months off a year doing adventure travel and personal development stuff. And we, my wife works about 20 hours a week as a couples and family counselor and coach. And I do what I do. And I, we feel like the luckiest people on the planet, but it's been very, very intentional. And, and part of it comes down to, I think one, defining what we want, just when, it, when we're really honest about it, I gotta tell you, it scares the hell out of you. It's like, yeah. I, I, wanna, I want that? Well, what if I don't get it? Well, but we're never gonna get it if we don't make those definitions. So, so simplifying things and coming up with, and I, I, I love that you think this is basic because I believe it is, but we get out, of, we get in our own way so much that we complicate the crap out of it when we don't have to. But there are ways, but easy doesn't mean, or simple doesn't mean easy. And that's where I think a lot of people get confused. Oh, that's a really good point. I think you're right about that. I think you're right about that. And I think one of the, one of my favorite words that, that you've used a couple of times is intentional. Because I feel like that changes the game. That changes the dynamic. I do workshops on uh, helping people to define what success is, particularly like, uh, you know, college kids and, and other groups. But, but the intention with that is that so often, and I can tell you with the, the leadership work I do and with the strategic advising and whatnot, almost 90% of the businesses I know live their lives in a reactionary mode. They don't think about where they're going on vacation. It's just whatever comes their way. And that's how most people start their, their businesses. And, but if we can transition that, I think it goes a long way. Oh, I do too. I do too. I, th I think it leads to everything that, um, that you're talking about. Uh, it, it's, and I agree with you. I think people just start and go and then all of a sudden one day turn around and say, this is where I am. But they weren't necessarily pointing at anything to begin with. So, Well, and I think... I'm sorry. No, go ahead. So, so, so I think a lot of times um, when I'm working with people and they're thinking about doing startup, they think this is their only shot and they're scared to death. It's like, oh my God, my, my life is miserable. I hate my job. This is horrible, blah, blah. And this is my only shot. And if I don't do this one, it, it's not going to work. And I can tell you, I have gone through the process that I do in the book and we do in our success camps. I have literally done it hundreds of times. And to me, if somebody goes through and they vet this and they vet what they thought their initial idea was and they don't do it, I think that that's the biggest victory there can be because yeah. they realize, I mean, that saves people's entire life savings or their relationships or their health sometimes. But to me, the most beautiful part is it's opening up a different part of their brain and they're starting to look at opportunities. Maybe that idea wasn't right, but if they pivot, and make some adjustments, that new idea is, is gold. But, but figuring that out and transitioning that thinking and being that intentional, I think, goes a long way. I do, too, and I think being a possibilities thinker. Like, I know when I started my business, um, one, of the, one of my mantras was, it was like two sentences, uh, we have to assume I'm going to be successful, and it's not the last decision I ever have to make. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. well, that got my husband off the ledge, you know, <laughs> when he was really nervous about it. And I wasn't, but, but really, if you think about it, okay, assume you're going to be successful. And you know what? If, if it doesn't work out or it, wasn't, it doesn't turn out to be what you thought it was going to be, go do something else. I, I transitioned out of a, you know, full-time, a lifetime of full-time work at the age of 45 with two little kids. So That's awesome. As my wife... 
she was a she was an accountant for a venture capital firm in the United Kingdom in, in London. And she ended up changing careers to become a couples and family counselor. I mean, are you nice. kidding? That's that's like completely different. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but in her particular case, as a niche, just as a thought, she she because she spoke balance sheet and profit and loss statements, and she was married to me as an entrepreneur, she could be a translator for couples who were having business challenges. And and by that, ah. nature, those are the kinds of, of things that, what are those skills that we already have that we love, that we're passionate about? Are you faith-based? Are you, you know, looking at nonprofits? Are you, you know, whatever those things are, how can we, how can we fold into those and embrace what that looks like? Cause then you're like, yeah, again, you get, to, if you get to go to work, you win, have to go to work. It sucks. Right. Right. Wow. I just love this. Uh, th this has been such an enjoyable conversation for me. Will you tell the listeners how they can find you and how they can get your book, please? I mean, we know they can get it on um, Audible, but where else? Well, I love that it's Audible, and it is The Aspiring Solopreneur on Audible, um, and then also on Amazon. And on my website, currently, we, have, we don't even have the paywall up yet. So any of the content and any of the materials, there's, um, there's videos, there's all of the materials are available for an entire workbook for how it works on there. And that's at uh, the aspiring solopreneur or excuse me, aspiring solopreneur.com. And you can reach me at Christopher Kluver on LinkedIn. Fabulous. Thank you so much for joining me. I, I, I appreciate your passion and the, the topic. I think it's really, really important for people to, um, embrace and you know give a lot of thought to and, and learn a lot about it because it is a game changer for an awful lot of it can be a game changer for an awful lot of people so thank you well uh, thank you so much i truly am humbled and, and genuinely grateful you took the time to, to let me join you this afternoon well uh, right back at you uh and listeners uh i always like to thank you you're who we are doing this for and uh i think you know th this is Many episodes we listen to more than once. This is probably one of them. And I would also like to thank our sponsor, Audible.com. To get a free trial of Audible.com as well as a free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth to sign up. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. ¿Por qué esta Coca-Cola de McDonald's sabe tan bien? ¿Será la máquina? ¿Será el popote o el hielo? ¿O quizás soy yo? No sé, Diego, pero vámonos, ¿no? El ¿Por qué esto sabe tan bien, Deal? Un refresco de cualquier tamaño por un dólar. Solo en el one two three dollar menu de McDonald's. Precios y participación pueden variar. No se puede combinar con cualquier otro oferta o cambio. Mío Coca-Cola es una marca registrada de The Coca-Cola Company. Are you tired of the same old productivity hacks? Have you read the top 20 books on effectiveness and yet your work days and email inbox still causing anxiety, burnout, and even depression? Ready to learn the latest in brain-based modalities, techniques, and technologies to optimize your success and well-being? Welcome to the Focus to Evolve podcast, where we'll illuminate your path to spacious productivity and balanced thriving. Each week, we dive into deeply insightful and immediately impactful methods to help you become highly effective while promoting health, profitability, and well-being. Say goodbye to the trance of busyness and hello to your highest potential. It's time to discover a new way of accelerating your mission, growth, and purpose. Join us on the Focus to Evolve podcast and get ready to live your most joyful, productive, and fulfilling life.